Bill W. became a member of DTNS today and now has access to secret things you don't, unless you're a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, July 12th, 2019. My wife's birthday. Happy birthday, Eileen. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline's grandma's house, I'm Sarah Lane. Back from a well-deserved va- vacation, I'm Len Peralta. Uh, without any disturbing vacations, I am <laughs> the sweltering producer, Roger Chang. Gordian Slip there. Uh, yeah. Len, it's good to have you back. It's good to be back. It really is. I'm, and uh, it's I'm an excited. auspicious day because not only is Len back from his vacation, but Nicole Lee, senior editor from Engadget, is back on the show as well. Hello, happy to be here. Happy birthday to your wife as well. Oh, thank you. I will pass that along to Eileen. <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the accuracy of uh, of uh, menstrual tracking apps and fertility apps. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the upcoming strike uh, in Minneapolis against Amazon. But let's start with a few other tech things you should know. Sources tell the Wall Street Journal that the U.S. Federal Trade Commission voted this week to approve a roughly $5 billion settlement with Facebook over an investigation into the tech giant's privacy violations. And now for something completely different. Google is really not a redesign of its news tab on desktop that is more prominently highlighting headlines and publishers and a new carousel that notes what people are also searching for. The redesign does mean fewer links per page, so it will be a new look and fewer related in-depth or opinion articles appearing underneath the story. Starting next week, Twitter is rolling out a new hide replies feature for users in Canada. The posts are not removed from Twitter, just hidden from your default view. The company says it knows that distracting irrelevant and offensive replies can derail discussions that people want to have, and we believe people should have some control over the conversations they start. Gartner and IDC both report that after more than six years of quarterly PC shipment declines, both 2018 and 2019 showed positive growth in the Q2 after Q1 slumps. Both point to a Windows 10 refresh contributing to at least the gain this year, but IDC predicts that the gain won't last, and Gartner points to a U.S.-China trade war, or a potential trade war, eventually affecting the PC market as more laptops and tablets, as most laptops and tablets, rather, are still manufactured in China. Volkswagen will invest $2.6 billion in Pittsburgh-based startup Argo AI, which coincidentally, well, not coincidentally, it's actually a team-up, also has a $1 billion investment from Ford. Ford and Volkswagen have been teaming up a lot lately. As part of this deal, Ford will get access to Volkswagen's electric drive matrix system, which Ford says it will use to build a fully electric vehicle for Europe in 2023. Uh, Ford and Volkswagen will both use Argo software in their separate autonomous cars. Uh, They're both making their own versions. If you're keeping track, there's a lot of autonomous car team-ups going on. Uh, Apple bought Drive AI. Honda is partnered with GM's Cruise. Volvo and Uber uh, build an SUV together. Waymo is teaming up with Renault, Nissan, and Fiat Chrysler, Hyundai, and Amazon are all partners with Aurora. You know, spring is a wonderful time for autonomous car people to fall in love with each other. Also a wonderful time to be a Hulu user if you care about 4K because 4K streaming is now back for Hulu users on fifth generation or later Apple TVs and also Chromecast Ultra devices. Only Hulu originals are available in 4K through the comp- uh, though the company says it intends to expand availability in the future. All right, let's talk a little bit more about what Amazon's doing in their research lab. Bloomberg sources say Amazon's Lab 126, the company's R&D arm, is working on a higher quality version of the Echo speaker and continues to work on its home robot that we've heard some things about before. Prototypes of the new Echo are reportedly wider than the current Echo, so you can have four tweeters in there. That would put it closer to being on par with the sound of a Sonos One or a HomePod in audio quality. As for the robot, internally, it's known as a Vesta. It's said to navigate by computer vision, and now the sources are saying it rolls around on wheels, so now we know how it gets around, and can be controlled, as you might guess, by voice command. It was hoped they would launch Vesta this year, but it's not quite ready. Amazon is putting more engineering and development resources into the team working on its release, according to Bloomberg sources, so uh, it doesn't seem like they're giving up on it. They're just trying to push forward and get this ready. Who wants an Amazon Echo that rolls around your house? I do. And also, I love the fact that they're like, and now sources are saying it has wheels. Like, how else would it get around? 
<laughs> well, I mean, I guess it could walk. I don't know. I right? guess that yeah. would seem like there would it's be a lot more R&D. Like, we didn't know. And now now the sources are like, no, we saw it. We saw it rolling around. It definitely rolls around. I I, I want this. I want this very much. Nicole, I don't know how you feel, but the home assistant, um, I, I, I've, 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 I've got a whole smart home thing going on with, with mixed results, but yes, the robot would be welcome in my home. As long as it, as long as it knows when to go into rooms, when it's not, when it's supposed to, and when it's not supposed to, like, you know, it doesn't like barge in on me yeah. when I'm sleeping. In other words, if okay. it works. <laughs> right. Yeah. If it works, I want it. I'm kind of like, I, I kind of liken it to like my dog where I'm like, yeah, yes. the privacy thing is, is, you know, you, you, you got to know your place, little robots. Um, I but, don't think it has any ability to open doors. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good yeah. to know. So a, uh, unless a, it's just strong enough to barge through one, unless I, um, unless your doors are you know Alexa controlled, then you know I don't know. Oh, like could the Echo on wheels? Could the Vesta play you a recording of you saying to itself, "Open the"? Yeah, no, that's. A, that's I a don't joke. know. Ooh, Ooh. yeah. yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Well, uh, in other Amazon news, workers at an Amazon warehouse in the Minneapolis area are planning a strike next Monday, which happens to be Amazon Prime Day. It's a big day for Amazon. The workers want higher wages. So they also want better working conditions. The strike, which will be accompanied by a rally and Shakopee, which is in Minnesota, is being organized by the Awood Center, which advocates for Somali and other East African workers and is a partnership between the Service Employees International Union Local 26 and the Minnesota chapter of the Council on American Islamic relations. Nicole, you've been uh, covering this story for Engadget, right? Yeah, so um, I'm going to be probably publishing a sort of a backgrounder piece on Amazon. I'm, obviously, Amazon has faced these accusations before, um, but however, this kind of large, this kind of the scale of this protest is more part of the largest in as far as the U.S. goes. And it's very interesting because Minnesota and Minneapolis is like the hotbed of this of this issue, partly because they have such a strong community there of these East African immigrants um, who, who, who've immigrated there. And uh, they have actually already set in with Amazon. They've sort of negotiated a few things here and there. Um, but uh, this this upcoming protest will be, I think, it might it might be the lynch, it might be the, the tipping point, I think, because uh, some some workers in Staten Island trying to trying to unionize as well. Um, so, yeah. Is there so, any chance Amazon could avoid this strike? But could could they agree to demands and uh, and turn? They you know. could. Like here, here's the thing. Like they've given them notice. They've they've given them a week's notice. Like mm -hmm. even in the December rally, they've given them like a month's notice, and they could very well say, hey, if you just like make it so that we don't have to like work so hard. Like they have to like every one of them have like, their quotas to me. Like, like they have to like pack three hundred and fifty items per hour or something like that is very, very pressurized environment. So they, they just want like, you know, not, not like not so pressure laden kind of thing, better, better mm -hmm. job security in general. So if they had just like said, okay, instead of like 300, you can pack 200 or something, even that would be like something, yeah. but they haven't made anything like that. So All right. um, well, you know, this is a, uh, a modern day face off. We'll see what happens on, yeah. on Monday, which will be a big day for Amazon shipping. They'll want to, they'll want to ship more things, uh, not right. better on that day. Yeah. Uh, well, just about every government official in the United States and then multiple countries around the world, uh, have criticized the Libra association project. Uh, Facebook gave an interview to TechCrunch's Josh Constein about some of the measures it will take to address concerns with the Libra associations. There are multiple people that are working on this. Uh, we're talking to Constein. The company says they expect Libra to incur sales tax and capital gains tax. Uh, really, the upshot of this interview is they're trying to say Libra Association is just going to be the currency management. And all of the things that people are concerned about will happen because other entities will take care of them. It'll be a store or a wallet or something that will have to be governed by regulations to do this. So if you're paying for something with Libra and sales tax applies in the region where you're paying for it, then that sales tax should be collected. Capital gains taxes will be collected uh, based on whatever wallet you're using. And they point to things like Coinbase as an example of how this already works. Uh, they're in talks 
with convenience stores and money exchanges to apply anti-laundering checks when you buy or cash out Libra. Uh, anti-laundering checks already happen uh, if you're in, say, WhatsApp and you want to link your bank account. That that already is part of that. So they're not, they're like, that will already happen if you use Calibra in any of these other situations. Uh, but if someone wants to use, you know, a cash checking place for, for cashing out Libra, then we're working with those kind of checking, cash checking places to have the anti-laundering checks in place for people who want to use Libra. The spokesperson emphasized that Libra will not operate as a bank or interact directly with consumers. Facebook's head of Calibra, David Marcus, of course, testifies in front of the U.S. Congress, Senate, and the House on July 16th and July 17th. So uh, it it does seem to me that the Libra Association is actively engaging with regulators and they, all political spectrums who are standing up and condemning it haven't really talked to the Libra Association yet. Not that there aren't concerns to be worked out, <clears throat> but it sounds like Libra wants to work them out. Yeah, Nicole, I don't know how you feel about this, but yeah, I, I'm I'm sort of in, I'm in the crypto world of like, if I can use a Calibra wallet to interact on Facebook in any way where I get a better rate than I would somewhere else, I'll do it. The more regulation, the more uh, that that certain people will feel, uh, you know, they they can rest easier that this is this is currency that's that's going by the rules that 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 govern other currencies, but also continue to kind of take back the fun part of this that you know this, this whole sort of like oh the new currency this this whole thing it's a you know sovereign nation blah 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 well it sounds like it's gonna be a lot harder than that well that's the thing i think you know most of these uh regulators and government entities they're they're very critical and skeptical of this because because facebook's name is attached to it Obviously, because there's a lot, of, there's a lot of um, concerns about privacy and all of those issues, which Facebook has, understandably, you know, that's why that they're, they're so skeptical and of, of of Facebook. But the way this is being done, and you know, whether or not you trust it or not, the way at least what it's presented as seems to be kind of on the up and up. Just because there are 28 members of this organization, Facebook is only one of the 28, so they they have. Not they don't, they, 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 there is no majority voting stakes for Facebook in this Libra Association. They, they, each of the twenty eight members have an equal vote, I guess you could say. Um, so, and the the twenty eight members are you know, Visa, Mastercard, PayPal. So uh, these are not like run of these are not like run by night like random companies. These are as well established financial entities. So, you know. No, and here's the thing: people still don't really understand cryptocurrency. To be fair, like there is still a lot of confusion about what is Libra, what what's cryptocurrency, what's Bitcoin, so what's a blockchain. And I think because there's so much confusion and people don't really know what it is, whenever there's whenever there's like these this confusion, people don't know things. Whenever, whenever there's ignorance around around something, people are going to just point your finger at somebody about something and facebook unfortunately is the favorite punching bag of everyone right now and it doesn't surprise me that there's all this confusion but um honestly if you look if you look at the documents if you look at the white paper it seems to be on the up and up for now I, you know? The, you know, the biggest problem with libra is going to be whether anybody wants to use it Right? Yeah, if it'll be compelling it. enough for someone like Sarah to use it, uh, who already has access to banking, and whether it will be accessible enough for people who are unbanked to be able to use it. Libra has answers to that. We'll see. At VidCon going on this week, YouTube rolled out a new monetization tool, a few of them actually, for creators, such as Super Stickers, which will roll out in the next few months that lets viewers purchase animated stickers to display in chat during live streams. YouTube also updated channel memberships to include up to five different monthly membership levels, each with its own set of perks. YouTube's merch program is also expanding partners with Crowdmade, DFTBA, FanJoy, Represent, and Rooster Teeth, joining its debut partner, Teespring. YouTube is also launching Learning Playlists, which offers dedicated landing pages for educational videos on topics like math and science and music and language. Playlists will feature chapters around key concepts and be ordered from beginner lessons to more advanced videos. And learning playlists will not show recommended videos and videos won't autoplay after the playlist is over. Learning playlists is a great idea. Uh, it's right now limited to a few partners, which is fine. 
part of me says, well, you know what? You roll these things out slowly. You pick the people who can make the best advantage of them. TED Talks is going to make great advantage. That's a wonderful thing. I love that it doesn't do the autoplay. It doesn't fall for a lot of the things uh, that are a problem with YouTube. But if you can roll this out to limited partners, which is picking winners, saying these are the people most important, I don't understand why YouTube also can't moderate its homepage and its recommendations better and pick winners there. They keep saying, well, we don't want to touch the algorithm. We want to stay unbiased or in one, on one side. But whenever they roll out new features, they limit it to people. Yeah, it's almost as if they can control it. Oh, I think they could. Yeah, <laughs> they I, probably could. <laughs> I suspect they could. And I, actually, yeah. YouTube will say, yeah, we could, but it's a bad idea yeah. in this case. But it's a fine idea in this case. And I yeah. guess eventually they will roll this feature out to everybody. And I think it's a great feature. I don't mean to. Yeah, uh, no, it's good. I love yeah. it. Uh, I think the educational playlist is something we could take advantage of on the Daily Tech News Show channel. Yeah, absolutely. Researchers from the Ben-Gurion University of the Negev have developed an attack called Control-Alt-LED that can exfiltrate data. That means get data off of a computer by reading the LED lights on caps lock, num lock, and scroll lock keys. Now you may say, why would they want to do that? Well, that means it would work on a secure air-gapped system. So this is a hack for intelligence agencies, for governments, for secrets, for classified information. But you have an air-gapped system that you have your super classified information on. It's unconnected to anything else. There's no network connection at all, much not even close to an internet connection. First, how do you get how do you get stuff off there? Well, you got to infect it with malware. That's not impossible. Uh, these air gap systems can be infected with malware by tricking someone into putting a USB drive into it or some such thing. That's probably the most difficult part of this exploit. Once you got the malware on there, even if the malware is running, it can't use the internet. This is an air gap system. There's no network connection. So how do you get the data off? Well, you make the LEDs on the keyboard blink at rapid speeds to transmit the data, uh, the attacker has to have some kind of line of sight view of the keyboard to record the flashes and decode them. Uh, you could just record the flashes and decode them later. A, a smartphone would work. That would mean you'd have to be in the room with the device. But if you could get a CCTV camera pointed at it and you could get that footage, that could also work. The possibility of this method was explained in a 2002 paper. So this isn't a new concept but this is a good demonstration of it. And the same team that's demonstrating it here uh, did a similar method using hard drive and router LEDs in the past. So it's kind of their thing. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, before the show, Tom was like, you know, it, you, you know, what's your follow-up question here, Sarah? And I was like, I'm not sure I have one. Don't <laughs> have a lot of and, gapped, uh, computers in your house, I guess. Yeah. Right, but but no, I and I, and this is sort of you know this is one of those stories where you're like, okay, somebody would really have to be going for it to make use of this at all. But it's very genius, isn't it? It's like using the caps lock almost in Morse code form to transmit data is really genius. I'm not saying you should do it. But I'm just saying I'm 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 somewhat impressed just by 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 the the idea of how this would be uh, effective. This is the kind of thing you're going to see in Mr. Robot, right? Or, yeah. or, or the next hacker uh, heist thriller film uh, that wants to try to get something right is the they'll they'll figure out how to get the USB malware on there, and then they'll the hack into the CCTV cameras and be able to read the LEDs flashing on the keyboard screen, and right. you know that's that's you're most likely to encounter it in the movies or TV. Uh, much more than, than in real life, but it's a real life thing. It could happen. Hey folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. So apps that track your menstrual cycle and often your fertility are quite popular these days. Garmin added a cycle tracking last April. Fitbit added what they call a female health tracking feature last summer. Apple announced at WWDC it's going to bring cycle tracking to the health app or at least improve it uh, and add it to the health app on the Apple Watch. But Nicole, I know you've been uh, digging into a feature on this for Engadget. Uh, are, do these things work? Are they useful? Are they helpful? What, what's the story with them? I think, first of all, there are, it depends on what you're going to use these trackers for. I think that's the number one question that I would have. Um, you know, if you're using them just to track your period, right? I think that's important for a lot of people, just for a lot of women, especially, they want to know what their cycle length is and when to, when to expect their next period, just because it's easier to like plan your vacations if you know what's, what's your cycle is like. Um, or 
are you using it to like get pregnant? Completely different use case. Like now, now you want to know like what your fertile window is, what your ovulation time is, like all of those things. And you know, having an app makes does make it easier because you just enter it into your phone and it taps it. Of course, nowadays they're making it, they're, they're incorporating it into all kinds of things, the Garmin, the Fitbit, you know, the Apple Watch. So it, it's more like convenient on the go. Um, you know, part of me wondered if this was like a weird like. Oh, this is for you women now. And this, I, I wondered if there was like a weird like gender, <laughs> like a, a, a gender marketing thing for these devices. And maybe, maybe it is, right? Maybe there is some aspect of that. But I also think it is actually somewhat useful. But then so I kind of looked at a few studies. I talked to a few um, researchers. And a lot of them kind of come to the conclusion of what I just said. It really depends on what you want to use it for. And even then, all of these apps have different algorithms of how they calculate it, depending on what you enter in each month. Um, and, you know, truth be told, the difference between one app and another, there's almost like no difference between a glow or a dot or a clue or whatever else right. app name it's, I can't really think of. It's almost always based on body temperature, right? Yeah. That, and that yeah. there, there's some sort of, there may be a thermometer involved. It may be only app-based. It might be something you're wearing on your wrist, but it's something that it can be quite accurate, but you, yeah. you have to feed it some accurate information as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's still up to the user to provide that information, essentially. Even, even if you do wear it on your wrist, right? if, it, if, you, if you forget to wear it, like that's not going to be entered into the you know your database, so it's still right. up to the user to, to have that information. And, and not not saying that it isn't useful; it is useful. It's just that it's not any more useful than you know so-called traditional methods. You know, as somebody who you know, I I, I have not uh, used any fertility apps uh, to in order to have a baby, but I have used them, um, mm -hmm. and and cycle. Uh, you know that. Uh, being able to to have some data on your own cycle, super, super uh, interesting and, and helpful, as you mentioned, vacation, great example of that. It's also just, I think it, at least for women, it, it plays into this whole kind of these data points of what we're doing with fitness tractors, fitness trackers in general right. are just interesting to us. Do I really care if I climb 10,000 stairs rather than 9,000 stairs? Like, <laughs> no, but I kind of want to know. I, I, you yeah. know, I, I like that. You know, these, these are interesting things throughout the month that I'm like, that is a cool thing that I can know about my biological, you know, being. Yeah. And I think another, another point to sort of keep in mind and to be mindful of with any of these tracker apps, you know, this is data that you're feeding into this app and the company is getting your data. They are, they are finding out when people ovulate and what their cycle is, what their cervical mucus is like each month. It, no, maybe you don't care that these companies know about it, but just know that it is being fed into these companies and they're probably going to use it for some kind of marketing, some kind of data Sure. Uh, database of information. So whereas like if you just kept it to yourself and just give it to your doctor, that's private information that only you and your medical professional will keep because that's you know, under the oath, a uh, medical oath thing. Whereas this one is just kind of like, you know, if you want this information, have at it, which it's, 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 a, it's up to you and how you feel about your data privacy. Which I mean, that's that's a good reason to maybe not use an app, uh, right. Roger. I know uh, your wife was using a device uh, for fertility tracking, right? Uh, yes, and uh, we we did it for for our first child, and you know it was just a simple ovulation tracker. It had a bunch of test strips. I'm just wondering, do these apps provide any ad ad advantage other than convenience in terms of like, oh, these are more accurate. These are going to be more precise in over these like basically uh, drugstore, you know, you buy it off the off the off the shelf um, options. I think those sticks you mentioned, the ovulation stick yep. tech. I think those are still probably more scientifically accurate than an app, uh, just because the app does rely again on user input and all of those things can be are variable entities. Uh, whereas the LH stick just literally adjusts the the, num the amount of luteinizing hormone in your urine, which is, so that's a very specific, you know, quantitative thing. Um, so I do think the sticks are probably more accurate, but then you have to buy them, which, you know, they're kind of expensive. Yeah. Um, so it's like 30 bucks. And, and so, but you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's very interesting that, um, 
you know, all these all these fitness trackers, I mean, they're using data that they already collect or based on user input. And I've always yeah. been, um, you know, I've always been curious to know if there are ways to track parts of, you know, the human physiology without necessarily having something invasive. You know, using a strip isn't terribly invasive, but it's still kind of, you know, awkward to use. Yeah, it's not passive collection. Yeah. By <laughs> I also yeah. wonder, and you know, this is me just being dramatic, but I I wonder, okay, if uh, if if data like this is is leaked to a third party that may not have your best interest in mind, marketing fine, but what you know, when is going to be, and maybe this has already happened, when is going to be the first situation where someone's like, well, hold on, look at that fertility data, this doesn't sound right. Now we have a paternity lawsuit involved. Mm. Oh, wow. Well, that's the kind of situation where it might not be leaked, but if someone is conducting a lawsuit and knows that data exists, they might subpoena it. Yeah. And then, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then the Fitbit or whatever might be like, well, we've got a, you know, we've got a court order that we've got to hand this over. You know, mm -hmm. this isn't us handing it over to a marketing company without your knowledge. Uh, this is this is complying with the court order. And our terms for all of our data say that if the courts, you know, tell us to turn over data, we're going to turn over data. So that that is a really interesting aspect of that, too. That's a very good question. Just remember, all of our parents got pregnant and <laughs> none of them used apps. So. That's true. You know, you you have to decide. It's true. It's I mean, true. I'm not. If you it's not you like have you the options. Audience yeah. yeah. You know who else has options? Everybody who participates in our subreddit. <laughs> you can submit stories about fertility or other stories that you think might be great for the show. Vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com or also on Facebook. We got a group there. facebookcom slash groups slash show. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Got some good stuff. Yeah, we did. Mohan wrote in about our conversation about Amazon training its existing workers in new skills. Could doing some retraining going on in Amazon saying that they're going to put a, quite a bit of money into it, 700 million if I if I'm not mistaken. Mohan says one aspect that wasn't discussed was sometimes that's all the option that people have. For example, if a warehouse worker is given the opportunity to become a data scientist, then they might. Without this, they might have not have any other way. People get into most of these types of jobs out of necessity and oftentimes can't get themselves yeah. out for various reasons, financial reasons being a major part of that. I know this personally because I have family members in that situation who are much older now and set in their ways. Yeah, good good point. Uh, and we certainly, you know, we're trying to make it sound like the, the retraining would solve all the ills of everyone, but yeah. it's better to have those opportunities than not, as Mohan is saying. Uh, Chris in Fresno, California says, I continually get frustrated when hearing stories about paid subscriber numbers for major music streaming services. I can't open a web page without seeing an offer for 99 cents a month, Amazon music or Spotify free for three to six months. I know Apple has discounts for students for a limited time. Basically he's like, I'm not going to believe any of these numbers until I see average revenue per user, which is perfectly sensible. Like that's really the apples to apples comparison. Pardon my pun. Uh, Spotify reported $5.29 average revenue per user in Q1 of this year. Apple doesn't report its average revenue per user, but it did announce 50 million paid users in January, a number that does not include free trials. So they 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 announced a number that didn't include their free trials at 50 million. They had previously announced 50 million that did include the free trials. So if you scrounge around, there's a little bit of that number, but I'm with Chris. Uh, I would like to see, just give me some ARPU so that we can really compare these to each other. All right, let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been illustrating today's show. What have you come up with today, Len? You know, I found this uh, uh, topic pretty interesting. My wife and I are beyond this right now. We don't need it at all. But I can kind of see how it would come in handy uh, for someone who's trying to be pregnant or not become pregnant. And uh, what kind of made me interesting, uh, interested about this was, was that the, uh, uh, the Fitbit was not really working properly. Mm. And I can just see this would be something that would happen. <laughs> to somebody. Um, <laughs> I tracked my monthly cycle on my device and all I got was pregnant. Um, not that it's a bad thing, but if you know, no, no, but uh, there was someone in our chat room uh, a minute ago who was saying, uh, you know, what about people who are using cycle tracking to not get pregnant? Yeah. You know, yeah. they're not That's in situation they do that. Right. Right. Um, And yeah, uh, yeah. And so right. your art like mm -hmm. addresses that head on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. And uh, it can get it at Patreon, uh, patreon.com forward slash Len, or at my online store, lenproffstore.com. 
Excellent. Excellent. And so good to have you back, Len. And also so great to have Nicole Lee back on the show today. Nicole, where can people keep up with your fabulous work? Um, you can just go to twitter.com slash Nicole for any updates that I have about uh, my links and links to my stories. Excellent, folks. Uh, don't miss out. Get the cool stuff, the early stuff, uh, the ability to chat with other people, listen to the show live, and all so much more by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. And if you have feedback, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday. Join us if you can, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC, and find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. See you all Monday. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>